Melee sucks on Legendary difficulty. We've all heard it before, ranged is the superior way to play on Legendary difficulty, but is it because of AI bonuses? The answer is it has more to do with how they operate in the campaign map than they do on the battlefield, and the impact you do feel on the battlefield more exacerbates issues in the combat system on every difficulty. Now, some of you may already know this, and a good number probably won't, but either way, I found it worthwhile to deep dive into this because it helps demonstrate how the game works and might help improve your understanding of the game. We're going to run through the reasons why perfectly sound tactics on normal difficulty can lead to absolute disaster on legendary difficulty, among other reasons of the oversimplification that melee just doesn't function on harder difficulties. After that we're going to go into some examples to show how the player can overcome the AI bonuses and then finally conclude with how the subtle supremacy in the combat system favours ranged not only there but also on the campaign map and this is why legendary players favour ranged units. Welcome to Elven Plot Armor, and this is why it really sucks on every difficulty. And if you enjoy this video, please consider subscribing for new guides every week. Before we get into this, I do play almost exclusively on Legendary difficulty and had a hard time initially adjusting. To clarify, I do use melee infantry with every faction, and if you see my formations guide, my staple faction has four melee infantry in it. Because melee infantry aren't bad, they just require specific placement in order to function on legendary. So on the battlefield, the legendary AI essentially gets a 15% across the board increase to all stats and these stat increases will not show up on the unit cards. So to demonstrate this, the general preconception that all melee units die against the AI, let's go for melee attack. Now, since this is a percentage, it's going to scale up for higher level units, and in some rare instances, this 15% could transfer into a maybe 10 or 11 point buff, but up until the mid game, you're most likely to only see an increase of between two and eight at absolute most. Now, your initial reaction to this might be, my early fights on Legendary feel way more one-sided than this. It has to be more than just a couple of points in melee attack and defense. And the reason why this seems greater is often because the AI has a tendency to invest points in their base infantry. My assumption is so if they lose the ability to build certain units they can still always build and benefit from those points with the base level unit. But as the campaign progresses the AI has a far less tendency to spam a single unit and you're very unlikely to find a a lord that's completely specced out like a doomstack and b the accompanying units that would fill out said doomstack. So the other reason why this might feel more heavy handed is for players who have just come from normal difficulty because normal difficulty does not teach you how to use offensive and defensive infantry. For example, the Empire Swordsman can make up your entire front line on normal, but on legendary difficulty, the extra 10 melee defense for the spears with shields is a non-negotiable, and only having a quarter of your front line at most being swords to dive in is probably the most you would want. Because while they can function as line holder on normal, the disparity in melee defense will not hold up under legendary difficulty. However, a normal playthrough does not force the player to make this distinction between an effective line holder and flanking infantry, and that player is likely to have serious ramifications when applying what was a perfectly sound strategy or normal onto legendary difficulty. I'm going to quickly go over some of the pretty standard changes that you will need to adapt to your playstyle if you are moving up to legendary. First of all is a massive massive emphasis on good melee defense for your line holders. High melee defense is the most important thing, simply because holding the line longer will give you more time for your other units to come in and flank. And remember, flanking gives a 30 or 60% reduction to their melee defense, respectively, when you attack from the sides or the rear. The other major difference is the plus 20 reload skill, which no one ever seems to talk about. That extra couple of seconds off each volley will absolutely shred your units, so the emphasis and importance of shields is much greater on legendary difficulty. If your front line does not have shields, then you better have a lot of artillery so they don't get peppered with arrows, because shields are awesome. A silver shield blocking 55% of everything, even basic firearms, is something that scales incredibly well. It's actually quite ironic when you see most legendary players, including myself, are never really that afraid of melee infantry of the enemy. Even despite all these apparent buffs and bonuses they have over us, the priority is nearly always to try and use the ranged or artillery based units. So if you're new to legendary and you need to make a quick decision, a spear wielding unit 
unit with a shield is almost always a safe bet, the Greeks got it right. Now in terms of countering these AI buffs, most factions have research options which increase stats such as melee attack by a factor of about 5 which equals probably about the same amount as the AI buff on these early level units. But as previously mentioned, this will scale to higher level infantry, so let's have a look at the tier 4 offensive infantry, the Swordmaster of Hoeth. The player can recruit this with 46 melee attack, therefore the AI will be able to hire them at 53 melee attack, that is 7 more than the player. This sounds ridiculous right? Well, a lord only needs to be level 4 to invest 3 points in the red tree to gain plus 8 to melee attack and defense. This isn't factoring in you can continue along the red tree to power up the sword masters of Hoeth more if you so wish. In addition to this you can level up your sword master to rank 9 and receive another 11 melee attack. So the combination of the 5 for research, 8 for the red tree and 11 for experience, you can now take your sword master to a whopping 69 melee attack. Now I can hear you asking, the AI has access to the exact same benefits so the player should always be one step behind, right? Well, no. I am not going to open up the can of worms that is Total War AI, but it's safe to say we've played through enough campaigns to know that we don't see min-max lords with the accompanying doom stacks, and honestly the skill allocation looks like someone drunk dialed one of their mates. In terms of experience, the AI does get some free experience, but they'll never earn as much as the player because they tend to be more passive, and more importantly, auto resolve tends to wipe out entire armies in a single battle. And this means all leveled up characters and experience units get deleted in a single auto resolve. And this is why the AI gets the recruitment buffs it does, because it loses armies far more frequently. Now, due to legendary supply lines, the player by necessity on this difficulty has to abandon multi-stacks of chaff, in most cases, not all, and is more encouraged to favor a single army which can achieve the role of many. Thus, these units are likely to survive and reach higher levels. But now we're touching on the most broken ability under the player's control, the ability to fight manually. The ability to fight manually means that you are more likely to have two battles instead of one. When we throw lightning strike into this mix, it's actually quite reasonable to assume that a lord will be two to three times the level of the AIs. I myself don't like sack spamming and only sack a single time before occupying a settlement and even I have no problem absolutely towering over the AI in terms of experience. Each level of experience means more skill points to either stay above the AI or invest in other technologies which means you can get ahead of them in other ways. If the player does use lightning strike to full effect, the campaign essentially becomes a series of one-on-one -on -one engagements with the player using its more favorable stronger army to be able to dismantle several of theirs piecemeal. This also results in more experience. So if the player has the means to comfortably meet or surpass the AI in terms of melee buffs, why isn't it favoured on Legendary? Well, let's explore why Malay isn't preferable on any difficulty. Malay just compounds the existing issues for range supremacy on and off the battlefield. So let's start with the first and most obvious fact, attack, output and damage. Only the front line of a Malay unit can engage at one time. So even with a wide-ish formation, the majority of the unit probably aren't attacking and contributing to the damage output. This is useful for holding a line, but poor damage saturation when compared to the archers, whose entire unit can fire at once. And even if the front of their unit gets engaged in melee, the guys at the back are usually able to take pot shots at nearby engagements. The damage itself is notably high in Total War Warhammer, and that's because it needs to be. This is no accident, because in Total War Warhammer, they introduce flying units, and the key counter to these is missile units. So even with the high projectile damage they have, flying units still have a lot of supremacy and cavalry really do struggle for relevance. Point number two, flexibility in the campaign. So in addition to this anti-air support, the range units are one of the most preferred anti-infantry tools, able to assist your front line from afar without taking any damage, making anti-infantry units themselves really struggle for relevance who must instead get in there, risk losses to achieve the same result. The other major boon for missile units is when attacking fortifications, being able to shoot up or over the walls is often the most decisive element itself in winning sieges easily. Being a one-stop anti-air, 
anti-infantry and anti-fortification unit really creates a level of value that is almost too good for the legendary player to discount when they are personally usually resource starved and struggling to find any efficiency they can. Since ranged units can cover multiple roles, this means that it's very lucrative to invest in them and their ammunition which allows them to function. Infantry on the other hand, even if they're not quite up to the task, they can still hold the line at least to some extent. And again, this is only one major function. Now the third point, and the most important especially for legendary difficulty, is sustainability. Legendary players hold this in much higher regard than a few points in melee attack or melee defense. Now after the battle, when the army returns to the campaign map, ranged units have all their ammo returned to them. So in theory, a ranged unit can fight an infinite number of battles so long as they don't lose a single man. If they do lose a man, they lose that man's worth of output, but as long as they don't, they will effectively be able to shoot forever. Now compare this to a melee infantryman. They are going to be able to fight one battle, lose a couple of guys, the next, lose a couple of guys, and then so forth. So they, they are very limited in the amount of battles they can do in a single turn. And the difficult thing about legendary difficulty is you often have to fight multiple fights in a single turn. Now let's add in that plus 20 reload skill that everyone seems to forget about. This means you have all of hell and damnation raining down on your guys who are now walking into the range of everything in order to deal their damage. So they're going to take more damage and they're unlikely to be able to heal up all of their damage over the end turn because casualty replenishment is limited whilst ammo regeneration is instant. And now you're probably starting to see why you maybe only see one or two great swords in an army if you're lucky from a legendary player and you're far more likely to see spearmen with shields to protect your range units that deliver damage on all these different fronts. But even the defensive infantry also have to compare with characters. Some of these characters can do things like increase replenishment as well as buff other units in the army. And if the faction has access to the law of life, this means that they can heal the characters. A unit full of soldiers, if they actually lose the model, lose the man himself, they can't resurrect that unless they are undead and have access to undead magic. A character is only limited by a maximum number of hit points recovered each time, so effectively if they get badly hurt to the point of near death, when the next battle's over, heal him after the enemy routes. After the next fight, do that again, and he is as good as new, far quicker than any number of regular units can be replenished. So, to try and interject my own thoughts about this, and my conclusions are, Normal Difficulty does a very poor job of teaching the player the correct roles of infantry types, and the move to Legendary Difficulty is likely to see the misallocation of infantry types which will result in disaster, and people wondering, where did my infantry go? because on Legendary, for infantry to work, which they can, they need to be assigned correctly, they need investment, and they need strategies such as abilities, magic, flanking, you name it. But the result is builds and strategies that work soundly or normal just having massive exposures in a completely different ecosystem, that is Legendary difficulty. But this is also further compounded by the fact that range covers so many different bases and investment into range covers multiple fronts. An investment into infantry only really covers the ability to more or less protect your ranged units because they are your damage dealers. As you can see, this has a bit of a cyclical effect. Since legendary difficulty may demand multiple fights per turn, this means that ammunition, which replenishes after every battle, is going to be a much easier resource to work with rather than lives which only actually recover over the end turn. So due to the multiple payoff that investing in range gives you, as well as the flexibility to have your army back in fighting shape and be risk adverse on legendary difficulty, this is why legendary players flock to the ranged alternative over melee, which can be useful and powerful, but it requires investment with a smaller payoff than with ranged. And that's the end of this video. I hope you've enjoyed it and thank you so much for watching it to the end. If you'd like to see more analysis like this, let me know. It's a new channel, we mainly do guides here. But thank you so much for watching, appreciate the support. Please consider giving the video a like and subscribe. And this is Oven Plot Armor, I'll see you next time. Cheers.